Hi, and welcome to my studio. I'm Joel Papadix. I really enjoy watercolor, and there's only one thing more that I enjoy uh, more than painting, and that's teaching others how to paint. Um, I only have one rule in my workshops and in my classes, and that we don't discuss politics or anything else that might stress us out uh, or repress our creative spirit. Our painting time is sacred. It's where we escape from the cares of the world and get uh, lost into this uh, wonderful activity. So with all those positive thoughts and energy in mind, let's get started. Um, with all the, the doom and gloom out there today, I thought I'd do something bright and uh, cheerful, uh, a street scene up in Rockport, Massachusetts. Rockport, Massachusetts is uh, a little cape. It's called the, uh, the whole area is called Cape Ann. It's attached to uh, Gloucester. If you ever saw the movie or read the book, The Perfect Storm, it, uh, uh, it's that area, and it was a uh, uh, Rockport in particular. They were, although both were art colonies, Rockport in particular was uh, probably the more noted of the two. Um, it has uh, this quintessential uh, New England white clapboard houses all over the place. You know, cozy streets and white picket fence. Um, I used to teach there for many years, and a lot of the artists that I um, uh, that I that I know of that I admire. Uh, painted up there. Uh, one, uh, probably the patriarch of the whole area, was a man named Aldro Hibbert, who was uh, born in 1886 and uh, he died in 1972. Uh, he was uh, noted for uh, doing a lot of the street scenes in that in that area and other subjects. Uh, a, 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 a couple of pictures that you'll see in a moment is Rockport in winter and uh, winter motif number one. Another artist, a uh, very famous artist that used to summer up and travel to and exhibit up in, in Rockport was, uh, is the uh, American master Edward Hopper. Here's his painting called Adam's House. Uh, Anthony Timmy was my teacher, Arthur Maynard's childhood teacher, and I love his work. These, uh, 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 like Hibbert is an oil painter, so is uh, Anthony Timmy. Late afternoon Rockport is kind of a typical scene that you would see him paint uh, South Street, Rockport, Golden Autumn, and finally motif number one. And, uh, and if you look at that painting and motif number one that uh, that Timmy did, it kind of reminds us of the painting that's hanging up at the Ridge Road Institute where I teach in, in New Jersey. Um, uh, Arthur uh, did that as a painting demonstration. And boy, it sure does look similar to uh, Anthony Timmy's uh, motif number one. And then finally, uh, there's a... Uh, Ted Kotsky, who was uh, really a master at watercolor, he wrote uh, several books on uh, on uh, art books and how to. Uh, one of it's a uh, one of them is called uh, it's a classic. It's called Ways with Watercolor, and you can see uh, this painting, Village uh, uh, Village Vista Number One, and Village Vista Number Two, uh, kind of typical of the subject that he did. Really terrific watercolor painter. And when I uh, whenever I do a little street scene, I all these pictures that I just uh, showed you. They all come to mind and how to uh, kind, of, kind of compose a scene. Uh, before I, uh, uh, this is the picture you can download it online. Uh, if you want to paint the same exact painting that I'm doing, we'll go through the whole steps. Or if you've got a subject that's kind of similar. One thing that I do, you are looking up on this street. And I've included a lot of the road more than I normally do. I never like to make the road, whenever I do any kind of a street scene, go up beyond a quarter of the way up the sheet. I always keep it uh, closer to the bottom because that's a that can be a big static area where nothing's going on, and um, I've seen a lot of people do a street scene, put a road in here, and it's just a blank, empty space other than a couple, perhaps oil stains in the road or some texture in the road. But in this case, the road is really going to help our composition. The shadows that are kept going across the the street are really going to help with uh, movement and direction for the viewer's eyes through the painting. So. Um, uh, and we are looking up, so we can include a little bit more of the street. But normally, this can be a, a, a real typical problem for doing a, a, a street scene. And you know, think about it: when someone goes up to a, a a place when they want to paint a street scene to take a picture, the road actually rises up to your eye level, so you have this big area in the street. I often make a point in my uh, in my classes, and that when you do a a, a, a street, the road rises up to the middle of the painting, and then and here's the street, and then here's all the elements of the building. It looks like we're a bird's eye view looking down at this street.
street scene. But if you lower the horizon in a lower the horizon of the street in the scene, make it no higher than a third of the way up, it becomes uh, uh, less of an intrusive space. But it really helps m make the viewer feel like they can step uh, into the scene. Kind of what I'm doing um, here. Uh, before I started this picture, there's going to be a, a, a hedge a hedgerow of some roses in here, and I wanted to block them off. I used some art masking fluid, and you can probably, perhaps you can see it. Maybe I'll tilt it so, so you can kind of see it. It's a little uh, yellow in color, and I put a couple drops here and there where I will later on. I'm going to cover them up with some green, and I'm going to peel them off at the end of the painting, and then carefully just fill in the red for, uh, for some, of the, uh, some of the hedgerows. Uh, so I covered that before I started. You might find this, uh, the degree of difficulty in this painting is moderate or challenging due to the drawing in it. But other than that, once you get the drawing kind of worked out, it's not as difficult uh, a scene um, as, as you might think. Uh, we always, and I always, in my pictures, start from the light areas to the, and they're gradually built to my darks. So the lightest area in, in our scene is the picket fence. And the, and the white houses and I'm looking at the color but I never ever leave the white of the paper white there might be one little spot on a focal point that I might, might uh, want to leave maybe a, a clapper near the area where I want people to look I might leave one little spot there the white of the paper but normally I don't even do that there's color in the whites they're hitting with they're getting bathed with warm colorful uh, sunlight um, and you can even see it in the fence. The fence seems to be uh, a little uh, more have a, a, of a yellowish cast. Uh, the house itself, uh, it looks like they chose an off-white color. It almost has yellow in the color. This house back here, likewise, has some warm sunlight color in it. And I want these buildings to come out at you, so they're going to have a little bit more of an orange color. And there's a white house in the distance, and maybe that one um, I might put a little tiny bit of red or blue into it to make it recede a little bit. But before I do anything, I'm going to go over the entire sheet with some clean water. And then I'm going to drop a little bit of color into those areas of the building that I want uh, there to, to appear like it's being bathed in warm uh, golden sunlight. So let's load up a brush with some clean water. And I'm going to go over the entire sheet. This uh, painting proportion, the photograph, if you load it, if you download it and you choose to work uh, your picture from uh, the, my reference here, and by all means, go right ahead. I have, do not mind uh, whatsoever that you paint from this painting. This is how we all learn. This is how I learned was uh, 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 copying others or you know working from others. It's a great way to, uh, to, uh, to learn. Um, it is in the same proportion as a quarter sheet uh, a sheet of watercolor. I'm working a little larger than a quarter sheet, but a quarter sheet would approximately be 10 inches by 14 inches. So 10 inches wide by four, uh, 10 inches high by 14 inches wide. It would be in the exact same proportion as your as the photographic uh, reference. That might make it a little easier for for you to uh, to draw out your picture. So I'm going to get um, a little orange or a little cadmium yellow. I use these uh, butcher trays at home, uh, and I love them. Uh, I got uh, a warm butcher tray, and then I've got my cool, for my cool uh, sky colors. I've got a green palette here where I, I do all my mixing for my landscapes. And then I have all my reds, and again, another pool, cool palette. And this is just a general, this last uh, tray is just a general mixing area. So I'm floating some orange uh, color in the foreground house. And I'm even gonna throw it on the white picket fence. It might appear to you that I have a lot of color in here. I, uh, um, I am gonna pour off a lot of it in a moment. So, and I promise you by the end of the picture, it will look white. But it'll have a little bit of sparkle to it, which is really uh, kind of neat. So I got some orange in there. Some reddish tone as we go back, and then even towards a little bit of cobalt blue and a lot of water. I have a lot of water on the paper, by the way. 
And now I'm going to roll this around and I'm going to pour a lot of it off. Now I am not right now going to dry this up. I am going to um, wait a little bit and I'm going to do a, a wet and wet technique uh, with, with the painting. I do want to absorb up some of this excess uh, water along the edges and I'm using these bull uh, bulldog clamps to hold the paper down and sometimes water gets trapped on here and you're going to watch it. it and as this part of the painting dries the uh, water pushes back on itself and it creates a bloom. Right now the paper is soaking wet and if you can see I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, tilt the paper a little bit you can see it in the in the camera. Um, you can see a shine on the paper and the shine means that the paper is saturated with paint. Oh, uh, that reminds me, before I do anything, the, the light source is really coming in from this direction. And on these planes, I might, sometimes what I like to do is just to create a difference in the two sides to the building. I like to make, every time there's a shift in plane, there's a shift in value. And, or it can't even be a shift in color temperature. So maybe I'm going to float a little bit of blue. I'm not going to make it shadow, but I just want to make it just a slightly different color than the other part of the building. I'm pouring off a lot of the paint. So it'll look, it'll still look white. It'll still look white and these look like sunlight in those areas, but it'll look like there's a shift in plane. This will look like it's one part of the building and that one looks like it's getting receiving more sunlight um, on it. Okay. The paper is soaking wet, as I was saying. It's so wet I can see a shine on the paper. There's a really cool, there's a really neat, <laughs> um, cool meaning color temperature, it's true too. But there's a really cool shadow that runs up the side of the building. And because it's a cast shadow for perhaps some from trees that are off to the left of the picture, it's casting a shadow that across, the sh across the road, up the picket fence, and into the house. To me, they don't look very hard edge. They look kind of soft edge. And this is where I like to employ a little wet and wet technique. Um, and I, but I can't do it now. I can't take wet paint because wet paint... The wet and wet technique simply means that you take wet paint and put it into wet paper. And there's different stages of wetness. There's saturated, like it was a moment ago, and you notice that when I put the colors in, they all kind of ran all over the place. But in a few minutes, as the paper dries, as it goes towards the second stage of wetness, which is, the, which is what we call moist, the shine just begins to disappear. And it's at that point when we put color in, it kind of stays put where you put it and it doesn't bleed all over the place. It kind of holds its uh, shape and that's what I want. So, and I'm, and I'm starting to, you notice that I pulled the, the, the bulldog clamps a little tight so the paper dries kind of um, without any buckling. This is why I like the, um, when I work with a, the 140 sheet paper, the lighter weight paper, that's why I like the the bulldog clamps um, because I can do that and then level out the paper. Now there's a shadow that's creeping up the side of the picket fence and it's hitting the house. So I'm going to take some cobalt blue, a little bit of water. You could gray it out if you want. There's a number of ways to gray it out. I use ivory black or you could add a little orange to it and a little red light does the same thing. But I do want to keep it very blue on the blue side. If I make it too gray, it's going to look like it's an overcast gray day. This is the other thing that I do. I have a test strip out. I take an old painting that may have uh, failed, and I always glue it. I always tape it down to my the side of my board, and I test the color. And I'm doing it for two things. I'm testing it for value, and I'm testing it for uh, color temperature, how dark the color is. And in the actual mix itself. So I load up my brush. I want to get rid of some of the excess water out of the brush. I don't want to add more water to the painting. And there's a shadow 
that creeps up and it's good it's probably a good time to do this right now you can see that when I put the blue in it kind of stays put it doesn't bleed all over the place and I'm gonna try to make and remember this is a tree that's kind of cast in a shadow onto this house so it should kind of look like a tree form and it seems to go all the way over to this other uh, shutter up the roof a little bit and it appears to me like it's all soft edge and that has to do with the distance that the tree is from the house the further away the more softer edge the cast shadow looks I'm being careful to leave a couple little light spots in there that might look like you know how trees have uh, sky holes in them but I really like how the cast shadow right now is all kind of soft edge hitting that house don't be bashful with your value don't make your blue color too light it won't look like shadow so I'm trying to you know do my best trying to judge that 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 value uh, uh, correctly the shadows being cast on the picket fence and again to me this appears hard edged careful to leave a little white gaps here and there I'm not doing the, sh the shadow across the road yet I don't think I'll, uh, I'll revisit that later on um, at the end of the painting if there's any more uh, cast shadows that you'd like to include remember the timing is kind of imperative I don't want to wait too long if the paper dries this is going to be all a hard edge cast shadow I don't necessarily want that I really want to uh, uh, get the feeling or achieve the feeling that there's some space between this cast shadow that's hitting the walls of the building and and the area between it is there any cast shadows from the I don't think I'm gonna do that um, I'm looking at this pick picket fence back here and I'm, I'm, I, I noticed in the photograph that its uh, color uh, is a little darker white than the, the fence in front of it so maybe I can take a little uh, Cad red light again get red I don't want to add any you we don't want to add more water to the um, to the painting you just want to add color so that's why I'm, I'm I'm wiping my brush into the paper towel before I do that so I got a little violet you know a little change in color is good it might separate uh, between the two fences but right now it looks like I got a neat shadow being cast up uh, up against the side of the tree uh, rather up at the, uh, against the side of the building so let me hit the hair dryer in this next whenever I use the hair dryer I like to do a, an even dry I don't like to concentrate the heat in one spot uh, when you do that you have a tendency to, to cause a bloom on the paper there's big stains I don't want to do that So the next darkest thing in the painting is the, the clear blue sky. There's a, an old saying in painting, you either feature the sky or you feature the landscape or you don't do both. Uh, I don't want to have a complicated sky. Uh, there's a lot of complication going on in the landscape. There's a nice clear blue sky in our, in our picture. Um, so we're going to keep it nice and simple. Here's the thought uh, uh, with, with, the, with the, the sky. I'm going to try to bring... I'm going to do the sky. I can paint right over the green trees. They're considerably darker than the rest of the sky. So if I get any blue into the, this particular area, it's no big deal because I'm just going to coat it up with a color that already has some uh, blue in it in any way. Uh, but I am going to try to lose an edge. Otherwise, these buildings are going to look kind of uh, cut and pasted on the page. It would be kind of neat 
So I do my sky to bring maybe some of the sky into a shadow on the building, um, underneath the naive, uh, on the building. If I can do it, if I can't, um, I'm, I'm not going to stress uh, that much about it. But when you're painting a clear blue sky, there's a progression in it. You get the blue uh, of, of the sky. There are basically uh, three types of blues that you could use. One is cobalt blue, which is considered to be true blue. Uh, I, I don't think there's any other color in cobalt blue other than straight blue. And you'll see what I mean in a moment. And cobalt blue is unique. If you don't have it, get it. It's a color we use a lot of. Um, it's important when we do skies. The second kind of blue that you could buy um, is ultramarine. And like cobalt, it too is unique. There's no other color like it. But watch what happens when I put it next to the cobalt blue, and you'll see immediately a difference between the two blues. Cobalt blue has a little bit of, of a, a red in it. So it is, uh, and it's a little darker than cobalt blue, but it's on the violet side. It has a little bit of purple in it. And cobalt blue is true blue, and uh, uh, ultramarine is a, um, a purplish blue. And then the third kind of blue, which basically encompasses just about every other blue that you can buy, um, is slightly greenish. And I use... This is cerulean blue, and you'll see when I put it down on the page that it is has a slightly greenish cast to it. I, I prefer, instead of cerulean for my skies, I prefer to use um, Windsor Blue Green Shade, um, basically the same color. But in this picture, looking at it, it seems to be, uh, to me, mostly cobalt blue. So I'm going to grab a rather large brush. I get a, a, a large area to, uh, to kind of fill in. I'm going to take my cobalt blue. I don't want any gray in this time. I want it to be nice and clean. Um, I don't need to gray the sky out. And sometimes you'll see a progression of value. The higher we look up at the apex of the sky, the darker it is. And as you go towards the horizon, there's a, 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 a progression in value. It gets slightly lighter towards the horizon. I'll try to do that in this picture. So here's my uh, sky color, just made mainly uh, made of cobalt blue. I'm using a large brush. I try to paint around the chimney. There's a little wave in the roof. These older buildings, as they age, they tend to sag. And you might notice uh, a little curve, or uh, a lot of times you see an old barn um, in the middle part. Uh, with age, it dips or sags in the middle. I'm gonna be being careful here to paint around my, uh, around my house. As I go down into the trees, I want the color to get lighter. So I got nothing but clean water in my brush right now, and I'm going to half tone it or make it disappear. Remember, this is going to be covered uh, by a lot of trees. That uh, big bloom of blue in there will work out and we'll roll the paper around. Um, my paper is very wet. I notice uh, in my classes when people uh, try to do this, they only have so much water on the page and, and the water doesn't move around as well for them and it's probably because the paper is not um, as wet as I work. I'm going to fix that corner. Maybe I can, for the lost edge, I can take this nice big flat. This is a one inch uh, flat. There might be a little bit of a shadow underneath this part of the building. You see that technically is a lost edge, but I don't know how long that lost edge is going to last anyway because it's going to get covered by trees. But at least I made the effort. 
you know, um, it'd be nice to uh, kind, of, kind of pull some color uh, out, out into there too. But I don't see a, an, an opportunity to do that. I'm going to take a little artistic license. I'm going to grab some of this and create a shadow on the uh, this edge of the roof. So there's a little bit of a lost edge in there. I do have to watch those puddles. Let's roll the paper around a little bit more. I want this to dry uh, my sky nice to, uh, to dry nice and evenly, like a clear blue sky. You know, and while I'm at it, I could I could hit a shadow going underneath the roof. Sometimes the shadows on a white building could be a little darker in value. If that's the case, some cobalt blue and ivory black. This nice big, this is a brand new brush. Um, it's a uh, Robert Simmons White Sable series number 721. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's got, uh, and I love, love, love new brushes. And this is one of the reasons it makes painting a straight edge so simple. It's when they get, uh, as these brushes get older, uh, you can't get that nice crisp straight edge anymore. And I'll pour off a little bit of the, the water out of there. I'm gonna get too caught up right now on the on the clappers, but I got a, a little bit of a head start on my uh, uh, on some on some of my shadows. I really love the way the shadow on the house uh, creeping up the side of the house has turned out, looking good so far. Let's dry the sky up. Now I'd like to mass in my 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 trees in the picture. Um, uh, I have I pre-mix my greens, uh, and you don't have to do that. A lot of people in my uh, classes like the convenience of it, so they will often spend the morning trying to come up with uh, uh, these four greens. And what I have is a a green that we use for our sunlight trees. That's that one. And then we have another green that's a little darker we use for uh, greens on an overcast day. And that's that one. And then we have a green, a, a, a third green. Actually, that last one, that's our shadow green for the trees in the shadow. And then this is a green that we use on an overcast day. And all it has, it's a green that just we just progressively add more and more blue paint to it. We start off with a cat, uh, color called cadmium, uh, uh, cadmium lemon yellow, and we add progressively more and more uh, uh, ultramarine blue to it, French ultramarine blue. So these trees are in sunlight. So I'm going to use my sunlight green. It's a green that has more cadmium uh, lemon yellow in it than it does. Uh, French ultramarine. Now, I always struggle to try to um, paint a uh, decent textured edge. And I use a scraping technique to do that, which means this. I get rid of some of the water out of a flat brush and I scrape the edge. I prefer to work with uh, rough paper. This is a uh, cold press paper, so it's got a little, doesn't have quite the textured edge of the paper uh, that rough does. 
So it makes doing this a little bit more uh, difficult, but there is a little bit of a tooth in here and it really has to have a lot to do with how much liquid you have in the, in the brush. So I'm gonna extract a lot of water out of the brush, scrape it on the side. Sometimes what I like to do is just take the corner of the brush here and tap all in an effort to get a nice textured edge to my tree. The paper's a little damp, which is not a bad thing because it's gonna also give me a little bit of an, an unpredictable um, edge. It's a fairly dense tree. There's not a lot of holes in it where you can see through to the sky. Um, you'll, you'll notice there's a sky hole in here. There's a section in this part of the picture where there's considered to be more uh, uh, sky holes. I want to create a nice edge against the house. Now it's not down, it's not until we get down here on our tree that um, you're seeing uh, some more of the texture of the tree and you're seeing through the tree to the houses beyond it. So here I, again, I'm trying to pay attention to the edge of my tree. When I'm satisfied with the shape, I move on to the next area. Sometimes when I'm doing this for my uh, classroom demonstration, I get this ever-expanding tree because I keep trying to get texture in here and it just gets bigger and bigger and not necessarily better. And I'm taking a little artistic license, leaving a couple more holes in that part of the tree. You can see up here where the paper was a little damp that I am getting like a, a little a bloom. It's not necessarily a bad thing when the bloom when the bloom dries right um, it's a disaster if that thing just kept on spreading uh, different uh, kind of thing going on I don't want that to happen The other thing that I've been doing uh, uh, more recently years, I, I, I'm not a really a gimmick guy. I like to do kind of straightforward painting. But I have um, I was in a uh, trip this summer to Scotland and I was painting uh, outdoors on location and a little, um, I was putting some trees in and all of a sudden out of nowhere came a little, um, like it does in Scotland, uh, a drizzle. And it hit my green trees, but I really like the texture that it put into the trees. Sometimes these cadmium colors, you know, they're so good when we lay them in. They lay in kind of nice and flat, hardly giving us any texture. But in the lighter part of the tree, there's some additional values in there. So um, what I like to do before the paper is dry, I take a spritzer bottle and just hit. And I got to be careful because I don't want to hit the sky because the sky has got... Um, a couple things going on, but I like to hit that little area in there. You can see the uh, it was a little um, it was a little too wet, and I'm getting a bloom back up in there, and that's not that's not really cool. But we'll see how that uh, maybe I make my tree a little larger in that area. But what I like I like what it does in this area because our tree a little uh, a textured edge to it. So this green is basically uh, cadmium lemon yellow, not lemon yellow, it's a different color. Don't use it. It's got a, a opaque white in it. It gives it a chalky appearance, not quite the right vegetable looking green that we're after. Don't bother buying your greens. I don't think they um, 
There's a lot of them are uh, overdo the phthalo in it. And the greens can kind of look metallic. The best way to, uh, to, to do your greens is to mix them uh, with combinations of blue and yellow. I am uh, doing a little artistic uh, liberty in here because of that errant drop. Again, notice that I'm using the corner of my brush sometimes for the texture, sometimes the best shapes, I think, though, are when you scrape and they you just kind of get this really unpredictable looking edge. All right, can I carefully leave a couple more holes um, in this part of the air, uh, area of the tree? You'll see that in the in the reference. If your brush is too dry, uh, rather if it's too loaded with paint and you're using a smoother piece of paper like I'm doing, whenever you, no matter how hard you just, uh, try to scrape to get an edge, it doesn't happen. So that's why it's uh, really handy to have a Kleenex nearby, extract some of that excess water out of the brush, and then we scrape and just kind of hope for the best. Now I got a whole um, grouping of uh, green bushes in the front over here. I'm gonna, uh, they're up close. I'm gonna have to pay a little bit more attention to their, to their shape and texture. But I can use the same uh, green that I was using a moment ago. The same, around the same value. The value of this green is the equivalent of the color cadmium yellow deep. All right. Remember, I put art masking fluid on top of this so it's going to keep those areas of that part of the paper white different kind of textures to these trees it's uh it's it seems like it's got more um uh, uh, kind of a po pointed uh pointed edge instead of clumps of leaves we'll try to get that going now I'm taking the, uh, holding way back on the brush and I'm taking that part of the corner. I'm lifting up as I paint to get a, a textured uh, bush. Could do the scraping technique, whatever it takes to get a good shape in there, do it. pretty pleased with some of the textures going on in there. But as I'm doing this, the value is starting to dry a little light. So I'm going to feed back in more color into the area, a, a heavier concentration of paint. Now I got a, a, a little bit of a challenge here. I got to paint. Now I'm painting positive on this part of the bush. All right. 
but this bush back here is tucked behind a, a picket fence in the front. So I'm going to paint that picket fence by painting the space, the negative space around it. Not there yet. I still want to block in this bush before the majority of it dries. That looks pretty good. I'm pleased with the shape. Now I'm going to take uh, this uh, bush back here I can paint positively. And then I'm going to grab the corner of my flat. And I'm going to paint some of the spaces in between my picket fence. I paint this picket fence by painting the spaces in between it. That's negative painting. And the other thing, talking about lost edges, there's a bush right here, and then it's got, right behind it, it's got a couple shutters. Um, and a good opportunity to, um, and they're black, so this is a good opportunity to lose an edge as well. So I'm going to switch down. I was just just using a uh, quarter inch flat. I mean, a, rather a half inch flat. Now I'm switching down to a, a quarter inch flat. Now the paper on that is just about dried, and let's hit the spritzer gun on it, and that gives us a little added texture to the to the to the wash that I just put in. A moment ago. Here's a quarter inch flat. I'm going to grab um, some black paint. If our shutter is in the sunlight, I'd add black and red for warm color temperature. If the shutter was in shadow, I would add blue for the cool black on the shutter. So this shutter is in light. And that again is just a generalization. And I just take my flat. And my green paint is still wet in here, so we'll get a lost edge where the black kind of fades into the blue, rather to the green. There's a lost, uh, you know, a, a kind of a lost edge into, into that area. Now, we'll let that area dry, but while that's drying, it's time to work on, on our, our, our roofs and, and chimneys right now. There's a, um, a, a gray on the material on the shingles on the roof so I'm going to take a, a and I you know we ask yourself well it's in sunlight so it, it's probably on the warm side but sometimes the material itself can be uh, a, a, a blue color to me it almost looks like there's a little bit of uh, it almost looks like there's a little bit of pink in it so let's grab a little bit of black and a little red Kind of get, and I'm just taking ca some cadmium red deep. Doesn't really matter what red you use, just to make it slightly, uh, slightly reddish and gray. And about, you know, just judge the value. And again, before you go right to the painting and make a mistake, go to your test strip, see if the color's uh, good. That looks pretty good to me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with that color. I'm looking at the, uh, looking at the color. Maybe it could be a little pinker than that, but that'll, that'll do. You know, it's. It, it's darker than the sky. Make it make it a little darker in value. And maybe I'm a little light in the value. Looking at it now uh, in relation to the sky, so we'll darken the paint up. Put more uh, red and, and gray into it. You know, instead of having just a the same color throughout on my roof, make some variation in it. You know, maybe there were some birds uh, that were perched on it and left the uh, left a present for the homeowner on the roof, or maybe just the way the material faded over time.
so it's okay to have a little uh, variation in that in that uh, in that wash as well the other roof um, seems to be more on the gray uh, to me it looks like the gray green side and I'm gonna start with the chimney first I'm gonna get that I'm gonna do a little uh, again another opportunity for a lost edge in there chimney's made of brick reddish gray we had some leftover gray from the other roof And then while this uh, chimney color is still wet, let's hit the roof on here and it's a little lighter in value. Like I said, I thought it was on the gray green side. I'll just grab over some leftover green and I'll mix it in with the other gray color for the roof. A lot of water in there because I want the valley to be light tested on the test strip. And then we'll block the roof in. You know, we have a corner of that roof that was getting hit with some, you can see it in the reference, how uh, considerably uh, uh, darker that corner is where the trees are casting a shadow on it. So um, uh, what we're gonna do is before uh, this roof has an opportunity to dry, we'll hit that little corner a little darker. So some straight um, cobalt blue, a little bit of ivory black. And I'm going to feed it over the existing color. That initial attempt that the that I made when it was wet and wet. And there's our little corner. It looks like the that corner of the roof is getting hit with uh, 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 some shadow from the tree as well. I got a couple areas there's a there's some uh, a row of bushes in the front you know I might wait till the end to hit that in I'm gonna throw some when I get the color on the sidewalk and on the um, uh, on the on the fence there uh, first and then I'll go back later on and and you know put a put a bush behind it okay so I got shadow going up the fence in the back so more uh, cobalt blue The white picket fence runs all the way across here. Going to leave some uh, uh, white, bits of white for some uh, sunlight hitting it. And then we go into the sidewalk. Up in Rockport, the roll sidewalks are seem to be made of uh, asphalt, just like the road. And it looks to me like it's on the... Uh, reddish gray side I'll hit that in remember this color that I'm blocking in now is for the color of the road and sidewalk that's in the sunlight and I am going to go over again this in a little bit later for the cast shadow that's running across it so I just want to mass in the road a little darker if you keep the road too light it'll draw the viewer to look there and I really want them to look at the this is really the lightest part of the picture where I want them to uh, take it in so um, that seems like a much pretty good value there's some grasses and some weeds that are perhaps growing through um, the picket fence in an area so and while the sidewalk is a little wet there's a little opportunity to do a little wet and wet stuff
an interesting texture. Maybe it's something growing up the side of the, the fence in there. In a couple little spots. Okay, while that all dries and uh, the other parts dry, let's work on a little bit uh, on architectural detail. I got all these windows in the, in the, uh, uh, on, on the near building and it's catching some of the skies. They're very, very blue, but they're all light blue. You can see the panes in there. So I'll hit them first. I'm going to take a uh, sculpt out a good flat brush. You know, I always see them when I'm on location because I'm there's an urgency outside, and I'm always so much happier the way my windows turn out outdoors as opposed to when I go back into the studio. I have a tendency when I go home, I sit at my table, the drafting table here, and I really carefully rule out the windows, and they all wind up looking the same. They look too perfect a rectangle, but you know when I'm outdoors or I'm doing this for a demo for my, my classes and stuff. I don't have that time. And I seem to paint, you know, a much better, uh, more interesting shape uh, when I'm under the gun. But boy, I, when I'm here alone and trying to do this stuff, I put too many window panes and I hate myself for it. It just looks terrible. But I always like to be a little uh, less understated when I do these window uh, shapes. That looks pretty good. Okay, and now I got a couple of um, shutters. They're black and in the sunlight. So I'm going to grab my uh, quarter inch flat. And a little bit of black. I put a little blue in it to make it look like they're uh, uh, cool in the light. nice having these brand new brushes you just put the brush down and it gives you a, a you know a nice relatively straight edge And if a little bit of the black runs into the wet window pane, uh, no worries. It actually looks kind of uh, nice and loose and uh, kind of watercolory. It's a good thing. black and blue for the shutter in the distance here in this other uh, second building. Clean up the edge a little, it's a little too sloppy. And there's a, a window in here. It seems like it's on the uh, the paint on the gray green side. So I'm taking some leftover green paint with a lot of water in it. Paint a panel in there or two.
I'm pinning the shutter back in here and it's also going to help carve out the uh, post and the picket. So um, kind of you know, like what happened that little spot right there. And all the paper is a little wet and that uh, shutter is a little wet. I'm going to grab some of the green again that I was using earlier for my uh, for my bushes. And I'm going to let the green kind of mingle with the black for the lost edge. And I'm going to be trying to carefully paint around that post. Got a window up there, it's on the blue side. Again, sculpt the brush into um, uh, to almost like a nice point. Put a window pane in there and another one right there as well. Underneath some of these windows, there's a little bit of a shadow. And if I wanted to put a, um, a couple shadows underneath some of the clapboards, I'm going to take a little artistic license here. And I'm going to create a couple of shadows that go underneath the, uh, the clapboards. Again, a bluish gray, mostly cobalt. A lot of the brush sculpt the point. Zip a couple lines really quick across. All right, now I'm going to tackle the shadow going across the, the street again. Um, and then I'm going to take a cobalt blue, a little bit of the local color of the road. That's that gray that I used earlier. You can even put a tiny bit of red in it if you'd like. And these can be more hard edged. Remember earlier when I put the the uh, the shadows in. I wanted that paper to be wet to create the. Uh, The feeling like the shadow is very far away from the uh, thing that it's hitting. Sometimes these roads have a, you know, they're they're constructed in a way that so, to allow for drainage. There's a curve in the middle going, a bump in the middle going up, and then it. So it's not a level line going across the ground, uh, across the road. You know, and then of course it hits the curb. So it goes up a little bit and then back over. I'm intentionally leaving little gaps in there for uh, the sky holes from the trees. And then maybe even the shadow creeps up along the fence in that spot from the tree.
cast shadows has a tendency to get they're a little bit more uh, colorful closer to the source and as they get out uh, away from the source and the sky influences them they have a tendency to be slightly just you can almost see a slightly bluish at the end because of the influence of the sky in it and then there's a couple of uh, uh, gaps I'm gonna make some more um, I'm gonna fill this in more than it is in the reference pretty good okay this is um, this seems to be pretty dry right in there right now and I'm gonna take um, like I said I use some art masking fluid as that liquid latex product that you can buy and if you buy a bottle of that I'll in a in another demo I'll I'll, I'll do a painting where we use a little bit more of the the uh, art masking fluid. You get one of these things. This is a rubber cement pickup, and this very easily lifts off that latex rubber that we put on the page, leaving wherever I put the art masking fluid on. We're left with a nice bright white piece of paper untouched, so that we can fill in with the color of our roses. Make sure that when you, um, you peel this off that the underlying color is dry, otherwise you're just going to smear green paint into the area that we took uh, a lot of care to uh, 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 keep, keep white. You grab a small, you grab a nice number six brown brush for this to fill it, you know, to fill it in. And I prefer to sit for this. I'm going to take a little bit of alizarin and a little uh, cat, perhaps a little cadmium red deep. I got a violet color like that. That looks pretty good for the flowers. And with a nice pointed brush, just take your time. You don't want to have an overlap. You get an overlap, it creates a line. The line is a, um, a dimension killer. It looks uh, flat. So do the best you can. If you if you do overlap, there's nothing you can do about it now. But when it does dry, you can come back in with a clean brush full of water and you know cl clean up that, that darker edge This kind of tedious work um, talking about uh, soothing and how relaxing this activity is I've always found this to be just kind of mindless busy work which is good and we fill in all those little white spaces and it looks like we got a, a, a hedge hedgerow going Later on, we might hit when it dries. You might just hit a couple underplanes for a shadow on the on these uh, flowers, but just a slightly darker version of this pink to give that uh, to give the flowers an extra three-dimensional look. That looks pretty good. It'd be really hard to um, to paint around that to start with another. 
sometimes I, I recommend to people that they take um, do the flower first and then try to paint the green around it but uh, this is way easier and you get a way better shape if, if, if you approach it in, in in that manner now I do want to say a, a, a couple final things on how to finish this pic picture up we have some shadows in the tree in the in the green trees and stuff that we have to get to there's little pockets of shadow in there so to, to paint those areas we're going to load up the brush with our uh, shadow green and all this is is cadmium lemon yellow with way more ultramarine blue into it we load up the brush with the shadow color like we did earlier when we were initially blocking in the trees, you want to extract some of the water out of the brush because we want the texture on the on the edge of the trees. And I like to tackle the big areas of shadow first. So it seems like this is a fairly substantial shadow right in here. And tap in the brush in an effort to get a nice textured edge. I want on the bottom edge of this cluster of shadow to be more textural than the top. You'll see why in a moment. So I'm trying my hardest to create a good bottom edge to that shadow. Because I'm not only painting the, uh, the shadow pocket on that tree, but I'm also painting a cluster of leaves that are in the light. And then before that dries, I take a round brush and I hit the top edge of that for the half tone but I don't want to half tone everything. I don't want that all just to blend. I want to leave a little bit of a hard edge. This would be a good time to take a, a, a spray mister bottle. I got all kinds for this task. This one's a little finer mist. And again, I just like to hit, just so the shadow has that little spritz in it, that little broken uh, textured edge. Um, makes it look good and it thins out part of the middle part of the shadow. These cadmium colors are great, but sometimes they lay in so evenly, um, it looks like a, a layer of a, of a gouache or like you used a white or something in it. You don't get, um, you know, I love how this bottom part seems to have dried darker in areas, lighter in others. It looks transparent, but sometimes you lay in a green and it all kind of goes down evenly and there's no texture to it, um, and that's not good. I put the shadow in trying to get a nice uh, textured edge to the bottom again before that dries some clean water and I hit the top edge next grouping I don't want to make these shadow shapes all the same weight. So you notice I have a large weight, medium size, and then I got a small. And again, before that dries, hit it with a little uh, spritz of water. Clean your brush out. And we're going to put a half tone on the top edge of the shadow. Sometimes what I like to do as well, I've got a big, you know, a huge grouping of shadow. I could do in here and go for it try to paint the shape in as best I can getting a nice texture to the edge and you can see how consistent the color is and how evenly it lays in again I'm tapping With the corner of the brush with the texture and then again perhaps before that dries I want to hit a half tone on the top edge grab a half tone brush you know and, uh, and sometimes I just intentionally drop a little water right in the middle of that shadow so the shadow that part of the shadow dries a little lighter than all the rest and then a half tone on the top edge of that And then on the bottom edge, 
or the area below it. Down here, it seems like we have more shadow again. Fill it in. And then a half tone on that. What? Well, relatively flat light in this uh, in this uh, part of the bush in there. So I don't have to do, um, I do have to do some, but not, you know, not as substantial as I did over here in the shadow. But there's little pockets. Sometimes the best way to see the major ones is to squint your eyes a little bit as you look at it. And when you do that, you can see the major clusters of shadow. And when I did that, I saw a lot of shadow through here. Again, whatever it takes to paint a good shape, do it. Whether it means scraping the brush or tapping it. Do whatever you got to do to get a good edge on that shadow grouping. It looks like a decent shape. Rinse the brush out. And on, again, on the top edge, not everywhere, but in a lot of places, just hit a soft uh, a half tone edge to that. I have a little detail to finish up on that uh, uh, part of the picture, some uh, shutters and things in that area. Between the, the uh, this front picket is going to probably be okay with just a solid area of white. You know, it's funny. You know, in our mind, we think that we see a lot of holes in here. We begin to paint them, but I've, I'm more selective about how many, the number of uh, lines I'm putting through the picket fence. But I do have to do a few, but don't overdo it. It breaks. It gets busy when you do. So just do a couple, and they don't have to go all the way up. Or all through the fence. Sometimes just a, a few is enough to make the view understand that you're looking at a picket fence. And here, I can probably be a little bit more. Um, in number. And then perhaps like right in front of this, I see there's a there's a, a, a spot of some really light pink flowers. So let's uh, start with that color first, the light pink. I'm, re I'm resting my elbow against my hip um, to steady my arm out a little bit. I'm going to put a whole bunch of little dots of purple in here and while that are pink in here and while it's wet, then I'm going to grab a green and let some of those colors mingle together. And it looks like they're they're attached to some vegetation. On the chimney, every time there's a shift in plane, there's always a shift in value. Uh, maybe this side's receiving a little. Both edges are in sunlight, but maybe that side's receiving a little bit more. Uh, the, the, the part on the left is receiving a little bit more light and that's why I'm darkening the uh, the area that I'm doing right now so that it looks like there's a separation of paint but plain but it doesn't look like a shadow it's not it can't be that uh, that dark there's some um, detail back in here there's another uh, house with a shutter on it some window panes And if we had the time, we just carefully, uh, you can take your time uh, back in here and can carefully um, do a little bit more uh, detail. So it looks like there's a continuation of some houses in the back. There's a yellow house back in here. Remember, you can always glaze in the area around it. It's all pretty much dark. But if I want to make that uh, yellow house, I'll grab some uh, 
uh, cadmium yellow deep, perhaps a little red light in it. And it can always take the color and glaze on a darker color like I'm doing now, but don't try not to draw back because you draw that darker green over into the to the rest of it. To finish this painting up, I'd continue to hit some darks in various places, some more shadows, uh, you know, along the way. And I'm looking at the spot uh, where I call it quits. I want to put a little texture into here. I'm not pleased with that shape. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, today's demo. Uh, there'll be more to come. I'm going to try to uh, post post a, uh, a, a few more. The uh, photograph will be available as well as long as it's some of my notes. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. It's uh, uh, my website. Uh, please visit my website if you haven't already. It's uh, watercolor pop, uh, watercolor pop dot com, uh, and. I'm on Facebook. Please like me on Facebook, and I hope to see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.